This podcast is supported by Wesleyan Financial Services, providers of specialist financial advice to members of the legal profession. Wesleyan's team of dedicated experts have been helping law firms and their employees achieve financial well-being over many years, providing personal and commercial financial advice, in-firm seminars and online guidance. Strategic partners with the Law Society, Wesleyan is proud of its partnership with Women in the Law UK. For more information about Wesleyan, visit wesleyan.co.uk or to arrange a financial education event in your firm or a no-obligation financial health check, connect with Sarah Deacon, Wesleyan Area Manager on LinkedIn. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Talking Law from Women in the Law UK. I'm Sally Penny, MBE, a barrister at Kenworthy's Chambers in Manchester, the Joint Vice Chair of the Association of Women Barristers and the founder of Women in the Law UK. You can find out more about our organisation on Twitter at Women in the Law UK or online at womeninthelawuk.com. Today you'll be hearing from Professor Leslie Thomas, QC, a barrister who specialises in claims against the police and other public authorities, civil litigation, human rights, data and privacy claims. Leslie recounts an extensive career tackling racism, discrimination, police brutality, including his work on the case of Christopher Alder. He also reveals how he looks after his well-being through music and languages. I asked him why he chose to go into the law. I suppose more than one reason. I I would have been about 13, 14. I grew up in South London and that was quite an influential stage in my development. I remember studying sociology at school. I had some great teachers uh, who were very political in some of their activism, and I suppose some of that rubbed up on me. Also, it didn't help um, by the fact that I was stopped and searched by the police for no good reason. You know, you've got to remember this was the late 70s, early 80s. Margaret Thatcher just got into power, and there was a lot of injustice in our society uh, in a similar way that we see today, and I thought I wanted to do something about it. So, um, you know, uh, it was about 13, 14, I, I began to develop, develop an interest in law and saw that as something that I wanted to do. I mean, did you know anybody in the law? Did you have a role model? How did you go about it? I didn't know anybody in the law. I grew up on the, in, in South London. I went to a comprehensive. Um, my folks lived in social housing, um, you know, I come from a very modest and humble background, uh, and there were no lawyers. <laughs> in fact, there were no professionals in my family. Yes. The area of law you specialise in, which is dealing with deaths, how did that come about? Inquests, you and in Grenfell, you've been in some leading, leading cases, giving a voice to families who have lost loved ones. How did you end up specialising in that area? Well, I was never really interested in making a ton of money like some lawyers can do. I wasn't particularly keen on corporate law. When I was at law school, everyone was being groomed to enter the corporate world. And there was a small handful of us law students who wanted to go to the bar and be independent. And I had the belief that I wanted to work for myself and not for a firm, be responsible for what I did. At that point, I didn't know I would be specialising in cases such as, you know, um, debts in custody. In fact, it was more to do with social justice law um, of all types. That was what interested me. When I became a tenant at Wellington Street Chambers, having done a, um, a, a commercial pupillage, um, and I wanted to get out of that as soon as I, I could, I started representing tenants against bad landlords. You know, I did a lot of housing law. I did educational law representing um, children who've been excluded from schools. I did a lot of personal injury representing claimants 
um, taken on companies or people who had injured them. Yes. I did employment law, representing employees, taking on employers. I did a lot of discrimination cases, um, representing people who had been discriminated against. And then after spending, you know, uh, a few years, in my early years, doing those sorts of cases, I discovered police cases. And I had a real passion for doing police work. I took on um, um, a number of civil actions. I had been trained um, when I was at Wellington Street Chambers. I um, had a fantastic training. And there was one, one of my supervisors was a barrister there called James Wood. James trained me to do them, and so I started doing them. And what was great was it meant that I could have be in front of juries, but be in front of juries on civil claims, which is what interested me. The, the one thing I was never really into was doing um, crime, doing criminal law. I did a little bit of criminal law in the beginning, but it was never really for me. I, I wanted to do political or protest crime, where yes. you know, people had been criminalised for their beliefs. But as I began to develop and progress uh, outside the magistrate's court, I found that I was expected to go to the Crown Court and represent people who'd been charged with pretty nasty offences, which, honestly, I didn't have my heart in doing that. You know, that's not to say that people don't deserve the best criminal defence that they they can get, but it just wasn't me. I just, I I wasn't interested in it. And then, uh, all of a sudden, I was instructed on my first inquest and it had everything. It had, you could examine past the criminal justice system. You could be on the side of what I consider to be the righteous. <laughs> so, I was, <laughs> so I was representing bereaved families who had lost loved ones, who had died in the most horrific circumstances. Um, the advocacy was uh, uh, amazing. You could do really great advocacy before, before a jury. Um, there was fantastic legal argument. Oftentimes, these cases would lead to challenges in the administrative courts. So I was doing lots of judicial review. So it just had everything to it. And it was something I could feel really passionate about. And it meant that I could represent uh, many people from the um, Black uh, or um, you know, BAME um, communities um, who had suffered um, bereavements at the hands of the police, at the hands of um, prison establishments, at the hands of um, psychiatric hospitals. Um, yes. it, it just ticked all of the boxes for me. Wonderful. I, I always ask this, and it's really hard to answer, because especially for you, because you're giving such a voice to all these people, is there a particular case in your career which has really changed or touched you? You know, sometimes people say, uh, Dame, you know, um, uh, Laura Cox talked about a, a European case she did and that kind of set her on the path. And other people say it was the first case I did when I was on my feet and pupillage. Uh, I, I probably fall into that category. But I wondered if there was a, a case that you've conducted in your career which is really um, still stays with you now. I dare say none of them leave you, but um, that you could share. Yeah, um, that's an easy question for me because it's a case I will never forget for a number of reasons. It would have to be Christopher Older. Christopher was the black paratrooper who died in the Hull police station. And uh, I did his inquest in the year 2000. And the case was interesting on a number of levels of people. First, it was interesting because it was a year that the um, Human Rights Act came into force. So over the Human Rights Act is 19, uh, 1998. Yeah. Yeah, it, it came into force in 2000. And I did Christopher Alder's case in the July and August of 2000. And the Human Rights Act was about to come into force on the 2nd of October. Um, actually, 20 years ago um, this month. And in fact, it was 20 years ago I did Christopher Alder. My goodness, wow. where, where has the time gone? Yes, but, absolutely. So, so it was interesting on that, that level because the, the coroner um, embraced the um, up-and-coming human rights act. And so it was, a, it was really a, a fully compliant human rights inquest. It, and so it was one of the first ones that I did 
um, bearing in mind the human rights act. But the the main reason why I remember this case and it will live with me um, until the day that I pass this earth is because it was the first case where captured on CCTV, it was the first of my case captured on CCTV, where you see somebody die. And you actually see uh, Christopher Older die on camera. That was shocking in itself, but what was even more shocking was the fact that you had five white police officers standing around watching a black man die before their eyes. And they were laughing and joking in the in the police station. They they didn't check him. They were um, you know chatting amongst themselves. And um, Christopher was slowly passing before their very eyes. And you actually hear his death groan. And when he passes, um, that's when they panic and run into action and start to try to um, um, resuscitate him and deal with him. What's interesting, just two days ago, there's a film director called Ken Farrow who has done a number of films touching injustice and police restraint, police brutality. And he's just done a he's just done a film called Ultra Violence, which had its premiere two evenings ago. I, I would say if you if you'd be interested in the work that yeah. I do, to, to watch Ken Farrow's film. It's it's currently being showcased at the British Film Festival. If, if you go to the BFI. British Film Institute's website. Yes, yes. Um, you, you can see, you can actually watch watch it because it's showcased there. He actually, um, as one of the um, cases of injustice that he looks at, he looks at the case of um, Christopher Older, and you actually see the footage. I don't know how he's got the footage, but he's got the footage of Christopher dying on the police station floor. And the officers panic him when, when they realise it, and it's, the, and, and it's the first time I've seen that footage out, you know, clearly uh, outside the inquest. So yes, uh, that that's a case that really touches me. And and you know, the other reason why this case is important is Janet Older has just been an inspiration. She has fought tooth and nail to get justice for her brother, uh, and she has not given up despite the fact. That there have been so many hurdles. <laughs> the other thing about um, the older case is that it's a case where the police spy on Janet and they spy on me. Uh, we, you know, uh, we were spied on during the um, during the inquest, and I learned about that several years afterwards. Yes, yeah, quite. Um, Leslie, one of the things that's been really shocking and impactful for our nation and globally is watching the death of George Floyd in our homes. And so, you know, talking about Christopher Alder was just making me think about that and the emotion that we all felt. And of course, re-sparking Black Lives Matter movement. And you spoke about your own experiences as a professional Black person, you know, even not getting through the doors of security to get to court whilst our opponents and our colleagues wave through. I just wonder if I can ask you, and I always ask everyone this, but what do you think about Black Lives Matter, diversity in our country? How can we do better, get better? It's a big question, but Black Lives it's, Matter, it's diversity. It's a big question, and um, it, it's going to require a big answer. So let me see if I can unpick it. You look, one, one of the things you mentioned was the um, the death of um, George Floyd. Now, when I first saw that death, I, I, you know, and saw the first footage being brought into our homes, I still have not managed to watch the entirety of the nine minutes or so that George is under the, the knee of a police officer. I can't, I can't bring myself to watch it. I see too much death in my job. You know, that, that's my day job. What, what Floyd's death has done is it's brought um, alive this issue about police violence and um, 
discrimination and racism against people of colour. Now, here's the thing, Sally. George Floyd saying, I can't breathe, it is nothing unique to the cases that I've been involved in over the years. I've done several cases where police have restrained or killed people whilst in their care or in their custody, and they've been saying, I can't breathe. You know, a couple of cases come to mind straight away. I did a case in 2016, Terry Smith. He was captured on CCTV um, on a Surrey police station saying, I can't breathe several times. Uh, we had an extremely critical um, verdict. Uh, t- Terry was a, was a white man. Yes. But, more, but more recently, in 2018, this is a case that was decided last Friday, you know, when well, I said, well, well, last Friday at the time we were recording this. So, you know, yes. the, um, of um, Kevin Clark. Kevin Clark was restrained in a sports field in South London by several police officers from um, Lewisham Police Station. Now, um, you know, he's a black man. He was suffering from schizophrenia. He wasn't a criminal. He was a patient. He was having an episode because he had a relapse. And, um, he was, you know, several police officers come to him and they restrain him in this field. And he says to them several on several occasions, I can't breathe. And yet still they continue the restraint. And, and he dies. He dies under their restraint. And we have a jury a South London jury who determined last week that the restraint played a more than significant part in his demise. And this jury also finds that um, Kevin was saying, I can't breathe. And more importantly, despite the police officers saying, you know, all the police officers, and there were up to nine of them who were involved at various stages in his restraint, despite every single one of them saying, oh, I never heard him say I can't breathe, the jury found as a fact but at least one of them heard him say he couldn't breathe to the extent that um, one of the officers was saying, Kevin, you've got to breathe. You've got to breathe. Now, why would why would a police officer be saying, Kevin, you've got to breathe. You've got to breathe. If they never heard him say, I can't breathe. And the jury found the officers were not telling them the truth. So these cases, Kevin, Kevin was a large black man being killed. And I say being killed because he was restrained and the jury had found that the restraint contributed to his death by a number of white police officers indicates to me that we have a problem on our shores. This is not just a problem in the States. Now, where the Black Lives Matter movement comes in is that you've got a new consciousness of young people, old people, black people, white people, all coming together and saying that this is unacceptable. And it's unacceptable, not just in the criminal justice system, but across society as a whole. And and that's the power of the movement. You know, I I did another podcast not too long ago where somebody was saying, well, why Black Lives Matter? Why are Black Lives um, seen as more important than any other lives? And I said, no, you've missed missed the point. It's not that Black Lives are to be elevated amongst any other lives. It's Black Lives Matter too, or Black Lives Matter as well. And it's important that people understand that. And so when you have um, a a movement developing that says all lives matter, that's missing the point because there isn't a disproportionate number of white people who are being killed at the hands of the police. You just need to look not too long ago the Lamy Review in 2017, where David Lamy was commissioned by the government of the time, the Conservative government of the time, to look at the criminal justice system to see whether or not there were any um, discrepancies or injustices. And he found so many injustices. So, for instance, the, uh, the, the he found that there was, uh, and this is on the government's own statistics, a disproportionate number of um, black people being criminalised in comparison to their white counterparts, disproportionate number of black children being criminalised in, um, in in the youth courts. At every stage Thanks. of the criminal justice system, from um, arrest, stop and search, um, um, dec- charging decisions, prosecutorial decisions, and sentencing, and 
when you get to the um, prison system, Prisons, you have yeah. disproportionality in that when you look at the numbers of black people in this country, black people, particularly uh, young black men, are being treated in a disproportionate way to their white counterparts. Now, here's the thing, and I like this in the Lamy Review, where you have this disproportionality, if, you, if, if there is a good reason for it, if it can be justified, then so be it. But more often, there was no apparent justification for the, the treatment. It, the, 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 the disproportionate figures could not be explained. And what Lamy says in his report, at, right at the very beginning, is that we should have a system whereby, if on the face of it, there is no obvious justification for the differential treatment, it should be called out as racist, institutionally racist. And so um, that's really important. But this is a long-winded answer, and I apologise for that, Sally, but you can see, you can tell that I feel passionate about this. The, the, the Black Lives Matter movement has brought this all to front to everybody's attention in 2020. Um, young lawyers like Alexandra Wilson, who's a friend of mine, who... Uh, you know, I just think what she did was brilliant. She called out the treatment. Yes. I mean, undoubtedly, you and I, how many times have we been to court and we, we've we been mistaken for anybody but the barrister? It's, it's, oh, happened, yeah. it's happened to me on a ton, ton of occasions. Alex calls it out, and rightly so. Yeah. Because everybody's attention, oh, how terrible, how, how awful. But this has been happening for years. I know. I, I remember when I, I when I was a, a junior, I was a couple of years old, and I, there was a black woman in my chambers at Wellington Street called Nicola Williams, fantastic advocate, brilliant, brilliant barrister. And Nicola, I remember Nicola telling the story that she would be everyone but the barrister. She would be the barrister's mother, the barrister's sister, the clerk, you know, everybody but the barrister. And, um, you know, so when I hear Alex saying it, um, you know, sort of like 30 years later, she's still having this experience as a woman of colour entering the courts. It saddens me, but it doesn't surprise me because ask any person of colour whether they've had a similar experience. I would say the vast majority, if not all of us, have had that experience. Yes. Well, but Leslie, how important it is, is it to call it out? Because I can tell you it is exhausting. And when that happened, the number of my friends who were not black, who sent it to me asking, has this ever happened to you? It was extraordinary. And you're right. We have had it. But we can't call out everything. It is exhausting. You know, we go to court to, uh, in my case, whether it's a criminal court or an employment court, an employment case to deal with our cases, and yet we have this on top of it. But can we spend the whole time calling out everything? No, it's tiring. It, it, it really, and, and in fact, there, oftentimes we become so desensitised to it that we just see it as a, it, as a part of the experience that we have in the workplace. But I, I think it needs to be called out. Here's the thing. What happened to Alex was um, terrible, right? But not unique. Mm. What was interesting is what that she calling it out um, gauged a reaction that I hadn't seen before. That is, the, um, the the head of the court services, what you know, contacting Alex and apologising. Yes. And that's the benefit of it because what it means is it means that um, it you know uh, court staff. Court security, clerks and judges and other barristers, they need to think twice before they say, you know, the next time I walk into a robing room without my robes on, have you arrived in the wrong place? You know, what are you looking for? You know, whereas white counterparts are not asked that question. It, yeah. I want people to pause before they engage mouth. You know, yes. Who yes. work in the criminal justice system and, and so calling it out achieves that, that release. Well, uh, Leslie, I'm going to ask you sort of some slightly different set of questions now. You do quite a traumatic part of the law and you're passionate about it. I can hear that from just talking to you and interviewing you. And I can see a saxophone in the background. So I'm wondering what you, what you do for well-being, because let's face it, 
you know, the burnout rate at the bar is not great. You know, it's great the Bar Council's been doing so much work on wellness, well-being. But what do you do to switch off? I do, essentially, I have three key hobbies. So, yeah, you've spotted my tenor saxophone. I'm a, I'm a jazz, <laughs> jazz musician. And so I play the saxophone um, and I write small jazz compositions over jazz standards and chord wow. changes. That's the creative side of me that keep, keeps me sane. The second main thing I do for my well-being is I like physical activity. So I walk, and particularly during lockdown, one of the things that I do is that I've been walking about eight to ten kilometres every morning. I always have been an early riser, so I get up about sometime In the summer, I get up about 4.30. In the, in the winter, I get up about 5.30. And, um, and I go for a walk, and to walk about eight to ten kilometres takes me between an hour to maybe an hour and 20 minutes. And I listen to podcasts while I'm walking. That's a great form of exercise. And then the third thing that I do, I love languages. I'm a little bit of a polyglot, and I like learning languages. Um, I've been a lifelong uh, learner of French from when I was at school, and I try to keep my French up to speed. Um, since my early 30s, I've been a lover of the Russian language, so I speak Russian and uh, yeah, at an intermediate level. I, um, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say I was fluent, but I, you know, I, I, I can hold a, a reasonable conversation. I can even have a reasonable conversation about the law in Russian. So wow. do, currently, I'm actively learning Spanish and I'm actively learning Polish. Um, Polish is, um, Slavic language, uh, similar to Russian, similar vocabulary, so I thought that, that I'll try that. And I'm learning Polish and Spanish. Spanish, I'm, I'm not finding Spanish difficult at all. I, I never studied Spanish at school, and I'm just learning that, and I'm finding that fine. I'm, I find reading Spanish very easy. Fantastic. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm going to come to a tricky question at the end about uh, languages, because, of course, uh, there was Britain's first black female high court judge was fluent in Russian. Uh, and so I, I'll, just, I'll ask you something about that at the end. Uh, well, can I ask you about being a professor at a very prestigious college? How did that come about and how do you fit that in? The way that came about, um, I was contacted by Gresham's last professor of law, Professor Joe Delahunty, QC. Yes, yes. And Joe contacted me uh, and said to me, this was about a year ago, November, it was November 2019, and she said that her tenure as law professor was coming to an end. And she, she said, have I thought about applying for the position? I hadn't, actually. I didn't know I didn't know much about Gresham, to be quite honest with you. I knew I had listened to a couple of Joe's lectures, but I didn't know that much about Gresham. And um, I thought about it, um, spoke to some friends and thought, yeah, why don't I go in for it? But then I had to think, I had to think, how would I sell myself to Gresham? And I thought, you know, you know they've never had somebody who looks like me as a law professor in their 400 year history. So I'd be the first black law professor. And also, I don't think that they had somebody who'd done a series of lectures and presentations that I wanted to present, which I wanted to showcase the work that I did, deaths in custody, deaths at the hands of the state, human rights, um, discrimination. So I, I did a pitch to them and I had to do a mock, I had to do a mock lecture to them. I think they were, I think they were really impressed. They interviewed me, I think it was in February of this year. I proposed a series of lectures, including from one of the lectures, and remember, this is back in February, one of the lectures I proposed was that police need to exercise more restraint when they restrain. And then they took me on, they, they, and we made the announcement in, in June. Now, here's the thing. You know, timing is a funny thing in life, because the week that they announced that, uh, my lectureship, uh, my professorship at Gresham, was the very week that George Floyd was killed in the States, which was just... But um, the timing was just uncanny. And so I was able to springboard off everything that happened with George Floyd, the Black Lives Movement, 
with the commencement of my, my lecture series. I did the first lecture on the 1st of um, October, which, yes. was, which was the start of um, Black History Month, yes. which was nice timing. The next one's coming up on the 3rd of December. I love it, and, and it's what a wonderful platform. And yes. the response that I've had from people all over the world has been amazing. Uh, I think they really enjoyed the lectures that I, I did. Well, my first lecture, they really enjoyed and they loved my passion. And because I do feel passionate about what I speak, what I have to speak about, I think I've got a lot to share. And I, I, it's just a wonderful platform for me as a black, black professional, a black man, to show, show the world that um, we can be intellectual as well. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think being a role model is important. I never used to see myself as a role model, but I, I, whether I like it or not, I am. And yes. uh, people do do look um, look to me for um, guidance and um, uh, and advice. So I, 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 I'm, I'm embracing that um, position now. Which is wonderful. Now, something you said in that answer that actually in the pitch, firstly, gosh, you know, having been a, a, a self-employed barrister for God knows how, nearly 30 years, Leslie. I don't think you would have had a job interview or a pitch for for, for, for quite some time. Um, I didn't think so. So that must have been interesting, just prepping. But my question is about the way you look. You know, I've got two sons and a daughter. My boys have got big afros. Uh, you know, they're all under 10, so that's their choice. But, you know, you've got really quite nice hair. I can see greys there. You braid it. You, you know, sometimes it's in dreads. Um, is that a deliberate look, or do you, you know, because you could just shave it, couldn't you? Uh, uh, yeah, and... uh, it is a deliberate look. Uh, you know, I embrace my dreadlocks. Um, and uh, uh, there's an interesting story behind my dreadlocks. There was, uh, um, after I did the case of um, uh, Christopher Older, I, I received a complaint against me, which didn't go anywhere. You know, I think it's just... Uh, part and parcel of doing this job that you will, you know, if, you, if you're performing a public service at times, people will make, make complaints against you. Half the time, those complaints will be unjustified. <laughs> Speaking of which, I, I, had a, I had a complaint lodged against me recently simply because I had dared to suggest that race was inextricably linked with the fire at Grenfield and the member of the, the public wrote wrote to the Bar Standards Board, of which I'm a member. So, um, you know, they had to get independent barristers to look at this complaint but because I had dared to make a submission that the inquiry needed to look at um, race um, uh, it, it, when they look at, when they're considering why so many people of colour died in Grenfell. And that offended somebody. Um, and I think there are, that their argument was a fire doesn't discriminate well, fire doesn't discriminate, but you need to ask the question, why did so many black people and brown people die in, in, in this fire? It's the elephant in the room. But um, coming back to my hair, when my when this complaint was made against me um, about 20 years ago, I decided I'm going to embrace my blackness and everything about me being black. And I wasn't going to, you know, sort of like um, be respectable or do what, people expect told me that you know because all too often we as black people are told what to do with our hair you know black women are told oh no you can't have your hair like this you should straighten your hair or you know you need to have your hair in a certain way no 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 it, we should be able to have our hair as part if our hair is part of our our identity we shouldn't have to um, have our hair in a way that it is um, that uh, conforms to visions of white beauty or visions of um, white acceptance, and therefore, when I thought about it, I thought, you know, what I'm going to do. I, I, I at first I had my hair in cornrows, and then I, uh, you know, I had that for a couple of years, and then I, I decided, no, I was going to lock my hair. So I, I started locks in my hair, and my hair's been locked ever since. And, and um, I love my locks. And when I go into court, if I'm feeling, um, you know, particularly uh, as if I want to um, um, uh, be confrontational with a witness, I have my locks out. <laughs> I do that deliberately. 
<laughs> just, just to intimidate is part of the dark arts of advocacy. You know, seeing a black man with long locks, you know, sort of like um, uh, questioning you and perhaps um, challenging your evidence robustly. Yes. Well, let me ask you, we've talked a lot about music, the law, of course. Um, uh, what about reading? I want to ask you about a favourite book that you might have and why. And also, if you've got a favourite fictional legal character. My favourite book, um, a, a book that I um, come back to time and time again, is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. I just love that book. I love the quoting it everything can be taken from a man but one thing the last of all human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's way i, I just love that and and, uh, and what i take a uh, take from frankel's book uh, because he was a holocaust survivor yes. um, those who have a white lid can bear with almost any how yes. so um that's my favourite book. Um, I'm, currently, I'm currently reading um, a really interesting book. Uh, I'm trying to increase my anti-discrimination knowledge. And yes. so I, if I expect my white allies to be educated, I've got to educate myself. So I've got a ton of anti-discrimination literature. And the one book I'm reading at the moment is The Clapback by Elijah Lowell, which is a brilliant book, which... Um, it's, it, it's the guy that's calling out racist stereotypes. And what Lowell does is he unpicks all the racist stereotypes against black people, you know, sort of like, um, you know, our identity. Where do you come from? Why do people always ask you? So where are you from? You know, I speak like this, and it's quite clear that I'm a Londoner. And I still have people saying to me, but where are you from? But where are you really from? <laughs> or, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. um, um, he deals with stereotypes about food we eat, he deals with stereotypes about the police he deals with stereotypes about sport it's really funny actually because one of the stereotypes about sport, sport is black people can't swim and I, I actually remember my old school PE teacher coming out with some rubbish about black people having heavier bones and that's the reason why black people can't swim and he just bunks that myth. Um, so, you know, th those, are, th those are books that I'm currently reading. I always come back to Man's Search for Egypt. As regards my favourite fictional lawyer, it's got to be Victor Sofrentis from LA Law. I just, <laughs> I just love Victor. He was, he was handsome. He was smooth. He, he, you know, he was passionate. He was into civil rights, and you know, you had this. I don't know if you're, you're probably too young to remember LA Law. No, I but, do, I do, I remember all of them. It was brilliant. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I, I, um, in LA Law, Victor was the rebel, and uh, he, he inspired me when I was going to law school. I saw myself as the activist, the rebel, the one who would take difficult cases, the challenging cases. So. Um, that, that he was my inspiration. Fantastic. Now, um, Leslie, you are uh, one of the eminent chambers um, in the UK and indeed globally. Guard Court, you've got a uh, not an annex, it's now as chambers of his own in Manchester, Garden Court North. I wonder for young people entering the profession, because you've spoken at so many pupillage fairs. Uh, the inns events uh, in the temples, as you know, uh, not my inn, but uh, you've spoken lots of so many students to encourage them to enter uh, and stay. I wonder if you had maybe three short tips for um, young people because the climate is difficult at the moment with COVID uh, and finding places and just general struggle about the law. What would you say to some people wanting to enter the law or um, about retention or about? you know, longevity. I always say it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint, just to encourage. But the first thing I would say is you really do need to know yourself, know thyself, know, know your strengths, know your weaknesses. When you know yourself, you know what you're passionate about, because if you can be passionate about something, it will make the way easier, particularly, as you know, coming to the bar in particular is very competitive now. Now, I'm not going to tell anybody not to go to the bar, right? Me um, neither, yeah. You know, if, if that's your dream, you should go for it, but you need to know why you're going for it. 
So that's number one. Know yourself. Only you know what you your you know, you know your um, more, more, most secret thoughts and what drives you when you pull the covers of your head at night. And um, you, you you've just got to embrace that and be honest with yourself and follow your passion. So that's number one. Number two. You can't hit a target unless you know what you're aiming for. So you need to have a plan. And to have a plan, that's not something that's wishy-washy, that's going around in your head. A plan has to be committed to paper. So I always say, have a plan, write it down, right? And, you know, think through your plan. And here's the nice thing about plans. They can always change. And in yeah. fact, my plan has changed um, over the years. I um, I remember when I was about um, 25, I had a five-year plan. When I got to 30, um, I changed my five-year plan to a 10-year plan. <laughs> I, got to, I, I got to 40, and, um, you know, I made another five-year plan. Got to 45, I made another um, 10-year plan. You know, it, it, in other words, it, it's not something that's written in stone. It's constantly changing. Then the nice thing about plans, you know, you'll set goals in your plan. And if you don't hit a goal, you can always move it. You, you, can, you can change your goals. Yeah, But it gives you a direction. And so that's important, not just for beginners, but for those of us who have been in this game for a, a, a you know, period of time. It's refreshing to, again, commit yourself to people and think through where do I want to go and set some um, goals for the next few years. It just makes... Um, doing what we do, um, you know, um, um, better. Yes. The third thing I would say, preparation is key. Yeah. You really need to be prepared. So I, I prepared for this interview with you. Yeah. I, I, thought, I thought it was important to do that because I didn't want to shortchange the people who would be listening to this. Yes. By coming on, by coming on and just winging it. You know, everything we do, we should prepare for it. Now, oftentimes the preparations are not going to be the same, but some preparation is always better than no preparation. Yes, absolutely. Professor Thomas, it feels wrong calling you um, Leslie. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> um, I can live with Professor. Yeah, <laughs> prof yeah Professor. Prof <laughs> just, just, just Prof. I need to congratulate you because I've seen that you've taken a seat at Goldsmith um, University, which is an excellent university. Yeah, I'm really honoured. Thank you. It was such it was such an honour for um, Goldsmiths to invite me to become one of their visiting professors. So that that, that was just lovely. Um, I I just feel honoured that all these people um, would you know want me associated with their with their establishments or institutions. It's real honour. I still suffer from imposter syndrome. Yes. You know, I wake up and pinch myself and say, you know, is this happening? You know, do they mean me? You yes. Know, do they, do want me to speak yes um we and it's amazing i mean gosh we all do i think people who say they don't suffer from it are, are fools in my view um and i'm congratulating you because i'm thinking about what's next lord reed gave an interview about a week ago and he's got a plan you know six years before he retires and he's a great man and he was he's saying what lord neuberger said and he's saying to a large extent what lady hale said um who of course did much for women um you know i set up a women's organization and so i'm looking in the supreme court and i'm seeing the composition of that court and then i'm reading lord Reed's interview and watching it and i'm listening to you and I'm wondering, Professor Thomas, might the Supreme Court be a place that you might consider, or the High Court, uh, or, or the Court of Appeal, the decision-making places in the law? Uh, and what's next, really? Had you asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have said no. Um, you know, I just wasn't interested in becoming a member of the judiciary. Yes. Now, I, I don't know. I, it, it's something I might, I might, I might think about. Not, not in the immediate future, but uh, it's not something that I would rule out. Because I, I actually do think it's necessary for us to, when I say us, I mean, you know, people of colour to step up. Yes. And to um, take these positions. 
um, particularly when we have the option to do, to do so. So I would not rule it out. Whether or not they would want me and whether or not I would be capable is another issue. I, that I have no idea. I think a professor of a college appointed you on, on, on merit for your ability. Uh, that speaks volumes for me, uh, not just uh, on the basis of race. So you're more than capable. Can I ask a final question about gender? Dexter Dyer's Queen's Council, who's in your chambers, I, I love talking to him because uh, we have many debates about things. And one of the issues are, as you alluded to, minorities self-select out of established places. And often there is no progress, um, which is why I was asking the question about the Supreme Court. But I wonder, women suffer a double deficit. Absolutely. Uh, in, in society, particularly black women, women of colour. And so I, I wonder what you think about the status quo now for women. Um, I've seen all the statistics on judicial appointments. Uh, I've seen the the uh, FTSE appointments in, in, in business and in, in senior places. And so I wonder what are your views and what can we do to, to, to try and improve the, the issue of gender? So the, the, this is what I'd say. I, I, um, not all minority groups are affected in the same way. Yeah. All right. Um, and so... And I think it's really important to recognise that and not lump us all together. Yeah. So there's been a lot that that's happened in terms of the fight for gender equality. You know, you can see that in terms of judges. Yes. Uh, you know, you know, you know, at all levels. Yes. And there had, uh, there's still a long way to go, a long way to go, but it's moved a lot faster than it has in terms of, say. Um, people of colour. Yeah. And there's differences between people of colour. So, you know, um, there's a real problem in terms of, you know, black men in the profession on the bench. Yes. As compared to, say, white women. Yes. Yeah? Yes. You make, you make a really important point because you make the point about, I acknowledge and accept that, you know, my black sisters do not face the same difficulties that, so, so, you know, you know, the, the, the difficulties they face are different to the difficulties that I face. Yes. And so, that, you know, um, I know that there's a number of really interesting young black um, barristers who are calling out the problems that they face. And, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge, acknowledge that. So the answer to your question is what, what can be done? is I think it's it's important that we educate ourselves and we recognize we recognize that there, that there, you know different minority groups have different um, are affected and impacted in different ways and I think that's really important and we educate ourselves in relation to that and we don't just group and lump everybody together thinking that the experience of everybody is the same. Yes, fantastic. Professor Thomas, I think I need to have you back on this podcast because there's so much more we could talk about. It's, it's been wonderful. Thank you for talking law with me. An absolute pleasure, Sally. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And we look forward to hearing you play the saxophone. I think my children could learn a thing or two uh, from these endless lessons. Thank you so much, Professor Thomas. Thank you, Sally. Thank you so much for listening to Talking Law with me, Sally Penny, MBE. You can find me on Twitter at Sally Penny One. We'd really appreciate it if you left us a rating or a review. Thank you in advance. Remember, if you've enjoyed the podcast, then you can now buy Talking Law 2, a book with advice for students and lawyers on well-being, resilience, and of course, on financial well-being plus some of the podcast interviews. Thanks to Wesleyan Financial Services for supporting this episode. And thanks also to Sam Walker and our production team at What Goes On Media. See you next time.